Allah will forgive you and reward you. Forgive you and reward you. Be grateful to Allah for the blessings He gave them. Hasten to do the deeds that Allah loves. And He said in Surah 110, Surah Nasr, Surah Help, verses 1 through 3, When there comes the help of Allah to you, O Muhammad وسلم, against your enemies and the conquest of Mecca, and you see the people entering Allah's religion, Islam in crowds, so glorify the praises of your Lord and ask His forgiveness. Verily, He is the one who accepts the repentance. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reminding, and he was always repenting, a perfect man, always doing a stuff for Allah. So basically, like you were saying, Muhammad, as a Muslim, gave the very same command to the Muslims as he did to Israel. Okay. Allah said in verse 49, but those, the transgressors, who did wrong by changing the word from that which had been told to them for another. Abu Kharir reported Abu Huraira saying that the Prophet ﷺ said the children of Israel were commanded to enter the door while bowing and to say hitta. Yet they entered the door on their behinds, distorting the words. They said, Habba, seed in Shara, seed in hair. So this is another opinion. Instead of seed in barley, seed in hair. And Desai recorded this part of it from Abu Huraira only, but he has a chain from the Prophet ﷺ explaining Allah's statement. Hitta, saying, so they deviated and said Habba, similar, was recorded by Abdul Raza, and his root was also collected by Al Bukhari. Muslim and At Tirmidhi narrated similar versions of this hadith. At Tirmidhi said that it is Hassan Zaki. The summary of what the scholars have said about this subject is that the children of Israel distorted the laws command to them to submit to him in tongue and deed. So they didn't say what he said say. Perhaps they did not enter in the way that he said enter into the style and the etiquettes that he said enter. They were commanded to enter the city while bowing down, but they entered while sliding on their rear ends and raising their heads. This is what this scholar said. It's another opinion. Another tafsir completely different. They were commanded to say hitta meaning relieve us from our errors and sins. However, they mocked this command and said, Hinta. So here I'm showing you something that a different scholar said, but it's very similar. And it's also written differently. This demonstrates the worst type of rebellion and disobedience. And it is why Allah released His anger and punishment upon them all because of their sinning and defying His commands. Allah said in verse 59, So we sent upon the wrongdoers rizan, a punishment from the heaven, because of their rebellion and their defiance. Let me ask you something, folks. When today, when we say, I know the Quran says so and so, but, is that not rebellion and defiance? want to make sure. So what happens is that we can expect when we do that a rizan, a punishment. Allah equal opportunity. Yes, who said that? I like that. If we do not obey Allah, we will be punished. And Dahak said that Ibn Abbas said every word in Allah's book that says Rizzan means a punishment. Mujahid, Abu Malik, Asudi, Al Hassan, and Qatada were reported to have said that Rizzan means torment. So if we do not obey, according to this scholar, then we can expect what? Torment. Torment would be what? The hellfire. The hellfire. 
Ibn Abi Hatim narrated that Sa'd bin Malik, Usama bin Zayd, and Kuzayma bin Thabit said that the Messenger of Allah said, the plague is a rijzun, a punishment with which Allah punished those before you. So this plague that they had was a punishment from Allah for what reason? Because they were disobedient. They did not obey. They changed the word. They were not obedient. This is also how an nisa recorded this hadith. In addition, the basis of this hadith was collected in the two sahihs. If you hear of the plague in the land, then do not enter it. Another command from Allah. Ibn Jarir recorded Usama bin Zayd saying that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said this calamity and sickness, i.e. the plague, is a rizzun, a punishment with which some nations who were before you were punished. The basis of this hadith was also collected in the two sahihs. And Surah 2 and verse 60, I said I would come back to this. And remember when Musa asked for water for his people, we said, strike the stone with your stick. Then gush forth therefrom twelve springs. Each group of people knew its own place for water. Eat and drink of that which Allah has provided and do not act corruptly, making mischief or disorder on the earth. And often... Many places in Quran we see do not cause mischief on the earth. Do not cause mischief on the earth. This means don't be disobedient. And almost every time you see that in the Quran, in a couple of sentences before, you'll see a command that people broke. So 12 springs gush forth. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, inshallah. This incident, too, belongs to the story of the wandering Israelites in the wilderness. Parched by thirst, they requested Sayyidina Musa salam, to pray to Allah for water. Allah commanded him to strike a rock with his staff. As he did so, twelve streams gushed forth out of the rock, one for each of the twelve tribes. Sayyidina Yaqub salam, had twelve sons. And each had a large family, so large that each family was considered a tribe. Each with its own administrative organization and its own head. They had been asked to eat the man and sawa, the manna and quails, and drink the water which came out of the rock. In verse 60, the Israelites were asked not to spread this order, disobedience to Allah and transgressions of His commandments. This is also proof that it is permissible to pray for water. Now, it is something that has disappeared from the sunnah, but there are a number of authenticated du'a that we are supposed to pray when we don't have rain. Now, in the month of July, we don't pray that prayer in Florida because we get a rain every afternoon from 3 to 4. It's almost, you can almost bank on it, right? But there's also a du'a that if you are driving your camel or your Mercedes, and there's nothing wrong with a Mercedes or a BMW. Okay, just sometimes I talk about sometimes people sort of worshiping things. And I use those words. There's nothing wrong with a Mercedes or BMW. I need to correct that. I don't want anybody to think I'm hating on those cars. I'm not. Okay. But I do want to say that if you are riding along I-4 in your BMW or your Mercedes, there is a special du'a, or your Ferrari, or your Volkswagen, or your Ford Focus, and I'm not being paid to advertise these cars, but you, there's a specific prayer that you pray for safety in the rain. And there's, blessed prayers are answered in the rain. It's like the way that the prayer of a sick person is elevated, and Allah hears the prayer of a sick person. When it is raining, Allah listens to those people who are praying. So when you're driving in the rain, pray. Pray for people. When you're driving, a traveler's prayer is exalted. Pray for people. Don't do it when you're in the driver's seat. Let the person that's on the other side of you take your cell phone and ask Allah to bless everyone in your phone. Name them one by one. Okay. 
Yes. Yes, bro. Well, I actually know someone who parked in a red light to pray. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> he knew someone that parked in a red light to pray. Don't do that because that's not safe. Uh, go into a park area or somewhere that is safe. New York, too. Yes. Common sense. Uh, not good. Okay. So, Allah said, remember my favor on you when I answered the supplication of your prophet Musa, السلام, when he asked me to provide you with water. I made the water available for you, making it gush out through a stone. Twelve springs burst out of that stone, a designated spring for each of your tribes. This is the abundance, the exceeding abundance of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do anything in small measure. He gave each tribe their own well, their own source of water. MashaAllah. This is the abundance of Allah. But Musa had 12 sons? No, 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 no. Yaqub. Yaqub had 12 sons. Yes, MashaAllah. You eat from the manna and the quails and drink from the water that I provided for you without any effort or hardship for you. So worship the one who did this for you. And do not act corruptly, making mischief on the earth. And as you can see what I'm doing here, I'm taking phrase by phrase by phrase and addressing it. And this is how we break it down. We take every single phrase and every single verse and take a look at it. We get the magnifying glass out, the microscope, and we look at the jewel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in every single phrase of this beloved, noble, glorious, holy Quran. Do not return the favor by committing acts of disobedience that cause favors to disappear. This is powerful, folks, because when we are not obedient, we cut off the spiritual hose of blessings to us. We say, I want a lot to bless me. I want a lot to bless me. I want a lot to bless me. But we gossip and we lie and we talk. We do all kinds of sins. We don't pray. We don't pray. And we aren't thankful. We complain. And then we wonder why we don't get what we ask for. It's so simple here. It is corrupt, folks. As a Muslim, it is corrupt to not be thankful to Allah. That's pretty hard to take, isn't it? But that's what it is. And Allah said it very clearly. He cuts the hose off, but we are ungrateful. This is why in the life of the Muslim, no matter what comes our way, we say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. Even when the podium starts moving out from under me, I say, Alhamdulillah. This thing is wrong. Alhamdulillah. Ibn Abbas said that the children of Israel had a square stone. This is an interesting report from Ibn Abbas had a square stone that Musa was commanded to strike with his staff. And as a result, 12 springs burst out of that stone, three on each side. Each tribe was therefore designated a certain spring, and they used to drink from their springs. They never had to travel from their area. They would find the same bounty in the same manner they had in the first area. This narration is part of the long hadith that an nasai ibn Jarir and Ibn Abi Hatim recorded about the tribes. This story is similar to the story in Surah al araf chapter 7, although the latter was revealed in Mecca. In Surah al araf Allah used the third person when He mentioned the children of Israel to the Prophet and narrated what he favored them with. In this Surah Al-Baqarah, which was revealed in al Madina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed his speech at the children of Israel. Father Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Araf, verse 160, and there gushed forth out of it twelve springs. It didn't just trickle, but it gushed forth. And that's what Allah does. When you obey Allah, the blessings will gush in your life. When you ask Allah for something and you are obedient, you will see the power of Allah in your life. You will see things happen, folks, I'm telling you. 
But you have to be obedient. You have to sacrifice the dunya and be committed to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. Yes, brother. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Surah Al-Araf. Not Al-Araf. Surah Al-Araf. Surah Al-Araf. Okay. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Okay. In Surah 2, in verse 61. And remember when you said, O Musa, we cannot endure one kind of food always. So invoke your Lord for us to bring forth for us what the earth grows, its pot herbs, its cucumber, its fume, its garlic, its lentils, and its onions. He said, would you exchange that which is better for that which is lower or worse? <laughs> so Allah said, listen, I'm giving you these little sparrows, these little quails in abundance. So much that you just take them and you'll get all you need every day. Don't, don't preserve any. Don't keep any for the next day. I'm going to provide your needs every single day. So he said to them, Go ye down to any town, and ye shall find what you want. They were covered with humiliation and misery, and they drew on themselves the wrath of Allah. See, they weren't faithful for the quail and the manna and the water. Now they said, Can't we have some garlic? Can't we have some onions? Can't we have this? That? So this is because they went on rejecting the ayat, the signs of Allah, and killing the prophets without just cause. This is because they disobeyed, rebelled, and went on transgressing the bounds in their disobedience to Allah, that is, committing crimes and sins. And folks, if we are disobedient, we can expect the same thing. Allah does not change the conditions of man except by his own soul. You have to transform your soul from unconsciousness to conscious. You have to study your habits. You have to study yourself and correct. You have to be conscious of what Allah has said in the Quran and you have to be obedient to that. And when you do that, Allah will reward you. And you will become a nafs mutmaina. You will become a person at peace. Because you are in obedience to the one who created you. You are obeying that fitra within you that you were born with. The detention of the word Misran to any town in the Arabic text shows that it is treated as a common noun, meaning any town. But this is not conclusive. The reference may be to the Egypt of Pharaoh the Tanween, and we know what Tanween, for those of you who don't know, is we have Fata Kisra Dhamma as a vowel, short vowels, A, E, U. We have Tanween Kisra Fatwa uh, Dhamma, which is An, E, Un sound. So the Tanween in this particular word expresses indefiniteness, and it may mean any Egypt, i.e., any country as fertile as Egypt. Hence, there is a subtle reminiscence as well as a severe reproach. The rebellious children of Israel murmured at the sameness of the food they got in the desert. They were evidently hankering after the delicacies of the Egypt in which they had had harsh treatment. Imagine that they are saying, I want the food from when I was in a slave. I want the food from when Pharaoh was being so horrible to me. When every other year he was killing all of our sons. I want the food of that land. Musa alayhi salam reproach to them was twofold. Such variety of food you can get in any town. Would you for their sake sell your freedom? Is not freedom better than delicate food? In front of the rich promised land, which you are reluctant to march to, behind Egypt, the land of bondage, which is better? Would you exchange the better for the worse? Does this help you understand the meaning of that verse? Would you exchange the better for the worse? It would be like looking at our country before the civil rights 
and someone saying, I want to go back to Alabama and live like that. I want the hominy grits that were ground up, <laughs> that were like lumps. I want to eat that instead of the refined grits. They were covered with humiliation. From here, the argument becomes more general. They got the promised land, but they continued to rebel against the law. Their humiliation and misery became a national disaster. They were carried in captivity to Assyria. But is that the whole people, everybody? The Israelites of that time. He spoke with specific all, all these Israelites? Not one or two that were like, yeah. <laughs> you know, don't do this. They were, they were a rebellious people. And this is why I said in the beginning of the class, this is a historic teach lesson of a group of people. But I think what Deborah said is so powerful. Because genuinely, I, I don't want you to answer this question because it's actually not of the adepts to discount the Ummah publicly. We're not supposed to do that. But let me ask you to ask yourself, do you think the majority of Muslims are obedient to Allah? No. I didn't want you to answer. <laughs> that was like, whoa. <laughs> so, hence, look at what we're doing. In a so-called Muslim country, 273 girls were kidnapped under the name of Islam. In Muslim countries, Muslims are killing Muslims. Why? Because we're not obedient. We don't fear Allah. So we need to look at the history, because why does history repeat itself? Because we don't learn from history. Allah has made it so clear to us, so evident, that we're even surprised. Like Deborah said, you mean there weren't any good ones? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we need to look at this in light of where we are today. And that's why I encourage all of you toward change. I beg you to have spiritual goals on a weekly basis. What am I going to work on this week? What part of myself am I going to purify? Every week? Every week, every day. What is my spiritual goal for today? What is it this week that I want to achieve? After 30 days, will I see a change in myself? Or will I be the same old Abdurrahman, Yunus, Fatima, whatever? I'm not picking on you, sister. I just used that name, okay? <laughs> So let's look at this. <coughs> the Israelites were disobedient. And as a result, their punishment continued. And I want you to see this historical, because I'm going to explain this. I want you to stay with me. I'm going to explain some stuff before this class ends, if Allah gives me breath a lot. But still remained under the Persian yoke. And then they were under the yoke of the Greeks. They were under the yoke of the Romans. They were under the yoke of the Arabs, but what did Allah do to them when they were under the yoke of the Arabs? That was the golden age of the Israelites. The greatest history of the Israelites was when they were under the hospitality of the Muslims. Can we say that today? Or do the Jews in our community feel hated by us? Because of our ignorance. Because of the things that they hear us say that are contrary to the crime of the son. Yes, brother? Uh, I heard from somewhere that it's not it's not good to curse Israel because it refers to the name of a prophet. Well, it's according to the context, and we'll talk about that in the class today. You don't we don't curse anyone in Islam. It's it's we're not allowed to curse. We hate what Allah hates and we love what Allah loves. Can we curse Satan? And we curse their time. No, we don't, because actually, no, we don't do that. So what? Yeah, that was a class question. That, that was a class you missed. I'll catch you up later on. <laughs> yeah, the class I, doing uh, Hajj. 
you go into a story. Yeah, but that's not cursing. Oh, it's a ritual. Yeah. That's a ritual. That you, and actually, let's talk about that. You're stirring the shaitan in yourself. That's what the symbol yeah. of that is. You're, it's not the shaitan. It's the shaitan in you okay. that you're stirring. So every time you say Allahu Akbar, you're trying to humiliate a part of you that is prideful or arrogant or a part of you that is not in obedience to Allah. That's what that symbolizes. But in, the, in the Quran, for shaitan is shaitan is And when I draw something, I say, oh, this shaitan Mardud did that. Yeah. No, no, no. We say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan We seek refuge with Allah from the accursed Satan. Allah can curse the Satan, but we should not. Because when we curse him, he pays attention to us and comes back and haunts us again. Is that what you want? I don't think so. But that's what happens. When you curse the Shaitan, he actually comes back and gives you some more. The slaying of the prophets began with the murder of Abel who was in the ancestry of Israel. The elder son of Jacob attempted the murder of Yusuf when they dropped him into the well. Now we know that Yusuf was not killed, but it's about intention, folks. Nia was the key even then. We think that we have this monopoly on Nia and Islam. Islam began with Adam and Hawa, and it was Nia then, and it's Nia today. It's about what you intend. Do you intend to be obedient? Do you intend to clean your heart up? Do you intend to be grateful? Or do you, I'm, I got some complaining to do. And we brag about it. I got some complaining to do. I got something to tell her. I got something to tell him. And there we go. It's a stream of complaints. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Instead of a humble law, Allah gave me a test of law Akbar. MashaAllah. Yes, when I had my cancer, and there are many people in this room that will testify, I said, Alhamdulillah. I am so grateful to Allah for this gift. And my wife said, Would you please stop praying for humility because every time you get a test, I have to get it too. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is the spirit, folks, that we are grateful because we know there is in the unseen a gift for us. No matter how tough of a test it might be, we know that in the unseen, in the unveiled, it is a favor from Allah. And we will never find ourselves complaining. We will find ourselves always being grateful. And if he was afterward rescued by strangers, their blood guilt was nonetheless. Their intention was to kill Yusuf. In later history, they attempted to slay Isa alayhi salam inasmuch as they got the Roman governor to crucify one in his likeness. And they attempted to take the life of Mustafa. But the moral goes wider than the children of Israel. It applies to all nations and all individuals. <coughs> if they are stiff-necked, if they set a greater value on perishable goods than on freedom and eternal salvation, if they break the law of Allah and resist His grace, their portion must be humiliation and misery in the spiritual world and probably even on this earth if a long view is taken. Yes? Yaqub was the son of Ibrahim Yes. I just wanted to say The children of Israel preferred food inferior to manna and quails. Verse 61 has been indirectly referred to in verse 57. And sent down to you shade, manna and quails. And verse 58, enter this town and eat of the plenty. And it also occurred in the wilderness of Tith. The Israelites grew weary of eating the man and the salt, the manna and quails every day. And wished to have ordinary vegetables and grain. Allah commanded them through Sayyidina Musa to go to a certain town which lay somewhere in the wilderness to till the land there, grow and eat whatever they liked. The Israelites were ungrateful and impertinent, exceeding the limits of propriety or good manners, improperly forward and bold, 
And I, I put these adjectives in because I think that that's something I see in our people today. We have lost a spirit of humility that we need to find. We have lost our manners. And in my years of study, I did not see a religion that actually taught adapt and manners like the religion of Islam. But I also did not see a people that rebel against it as much as I seem to see my brothers and sisters. Because I will have to say that I experienced in my life when I was a Christian man, minister better manners than I have experienced in my own community. And I think we have to look at that, folks. How many people agree with that? Yeah. We talk about adapts and we talk about manners, but we are scared to bring people to the masjid sometimes because we don't know how they're going to be treated. Even perhaps otherwise it was their pattern not only to transgress divine commandments, but to deny them outright. Allah says this, but I don't do that. I know the Quran says I ought to do this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not, ain't nobody ready for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> slaying prophets, attempting to slay prophets, hostility and rejection to truth. Is that not hostility and rejection to truth when we say the Quran says something, but I'm not going to obey that? Is it not? Or is it just the only way I see it? They knew they were committing misdeeds. Their stubbornness and disobedience made them blind to the nature of their conduct and its consequences. And in the Quran, it talks about when we don't obey Allah, we become spiritually blind. We become spiritually deaf. Our hearts get sealed up. Nothing can get in and nothing can come out. And that's the price that you pay. If you do not obey Allah wholeheartedly and submit to Allah wholeheartedly, then your heart will become hard. And you will not have good manners. Is it easy? Can you have good manners and be angry? <clears throat> How many people do you run into that are angry? And if I had gave everybody a piece of paper, I wouldn't want to do this. But if I did, you could write down five people that you know that you identify as angry. Every time you see them, they're angry. And they're just complaining about everything. And then you wonder why they're not getting rewards. They're not getting the blessing. Through such persistence and willful misdemeanor, they drew upon themselves the wrath of Allah. In verse 61, they were covered with humiliation and misery. Disgrace and degradation settled upon them forever. <coughs> this caused them to lose the respect of others and magnanimity, and magnanimity Courageous nobility in mind and heart, generous in forgiveness, habitually avoiding resentment and revenge and unselfishness in themselves. Pardon me? How much of the of a difference that is happening, isn't it? That's my observation as well. And that's why I think we it's so important to look at these verses, folks. It's so important to ask Allah, oh Allah, help me to begin to change. Oh, Allah, help me, humble me, oh Allah. Be careful, because if you ask for it, Allah will give it to you. Mulana Mufti Muhammad Shafi states in Ma'awful Quran, one form of this disgrace is that temporal power has been taken away from them forever. For only 40 days, however, and that too, when the day of judgment will have come close. And this, remember, is from Ma'orful Quran. The Dajjal, the Antichrist, belongs to the Jewish race, will have an irregular dominion like that of a robber. <coughs> this cannot be described as temporal power. 
in the proper sense of the term, Allah made it quite clear to the Israelites through Sayyidina Musa salam, that if they continued to be disobedient, they would always have to live under the dominion or the domination of other nations. In Surah 7, yes. this is what I wanted to share with you that this came from my awful Quran. I did not know this before. I'm sharing with you from that source. Allah knows best. I did not know that. I had never seen that before. Yes. Allah Allah. Yes. But that, if we can, um, let's don't talk. Let's don't get on the subject of the jaw because that's a that's a, a three month lecture right there. Uh, sincerely, it really is. Um, no, don't be sorry. I'm, I'm glad you said it. But I wanted to go back and say that that's why I gave the references to where this came from because I had not seen that before myself, and uh, that's why I said as I continue to teach, a lot opens the doors for me to see things I haven't seen. So Surah 7 and verse 167, and remember when your Lord declared that he would certainly keep on sending against them till the day of resurrection, those who would afflict them with a humiliating torment, evil chastisement. Verily your Lord is quick in retribution, and certainly he is all forgiving, most merciful. And I just want to check my time. Good. As to how the companions, their successors, and the great commentators have interpreted the disgrace and degradation which has settled on the Israelites, here is a summary in the words of Ibn Kathir. And I want you to hear this, folks. This is from Ibn Kathir. It's not the words of Imam Sa'id. It's the words of Ibn Kathir. It's a direct quote. No matter how wealthy they grow, they will always be despised by other people. Whoever gets hold of them will humiliate them and attach to them the emblems of servitude. The commentator Dahak ibn Muzahim reports from the blessed companion Abdullah ibn Abbas that the Israelites will always remain under the domination of others, will be paying taxes and tributes to them. That is to say, they will themselves never have power and authority in the real sense of the